I loved that show. That's the only reason we played it. That was it. <laughs> it's not going to tie in at all. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. If you are new here among us this morning, my name is Gene, and I serve here as your worship arts director. I'm also what Pastor Wayne likes to refer to as a pit. That is a pastor in training, and it's one of the reasons I'm speaking this morning. Today we're going to be talking about faith, but first I want to talk about the happy days. You guys all remembered that show, right? We're clapping along. The happy days. <clears throat> well, faith in a family context is kind of like getting in the car with your dad when you were a kid, right? When I was a little boy, I didn't worry about anything, right? I didn't worry about where we were going, what we might be doing. I just hopped in the truck and I went wherever he was going. The only thing I knew was that we were going to do something we couldn't tell mom about. That was about it, right? <laughs> faith. We're called to have childlike faith. <clears throat> I know that much has changed in the world since the 50s and now, right? We, can, we all know that. But I can tell you this. I know that more has changed between the 80s and now than did between the 50s and the 80s. I know this because I can relate to someone 40 years older than I am than to someone 20 years younger, right? It seems like a lot of things have changed, but a lot of things between the 50s and the 80s were still the same, like family, right? Mom was mom, dad was dad, the old LaSalle ran great. Did you get that reference? If you did, <laughs> you're my, somebody got it. <laughs> now notice, I didn't say before that we were getting in the car with mom, and it wasn't because of mom's driving. Now, I'm trying to make a joke there about women or anything like that. It's because when I was a little boy, when you got in the car with mom, it was never good. It meant you were going one of two places, and they were both bad. One was either the doctor's office, right? Or something equally as painful, shopping. You were going shopping, right? Oh. But mom had a plan to get me through it. She would make a promise of either Burger King or McDonald's at the end of it, right? So that helped out just a little bit. <laughs> and she would use it one of two different ways, depending on how I was behaving. So if I was dying at the store, right, she would just give me a gentle reminder that we have food at home, right? That means we don't need to go there. If I was at the doctor's in pain or scared, she would start asking me what I wanted, right? What do you want? Do you want a happy meal? Do you want this? Do you want that, right? <laughs> but I'm sure she got this plan from God. Sounds a lot like what God tells us, right? It's going to be hard. You're going to go through trials. But if you're good and you love me, you're going to get a crown of righteousness, right? Oh, come on. That was funny. <laughs> All right. The central scripture here, and I'm driving Robert nuts because I went a little backwards. Matthew 18, 3. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So we're called to have childlike faith, correct? What is faith? If we read Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Notice how it says not seen. That's really important because we're on a need to know basis. It seems like as we grow up, we grow up from that childlike faith, just hopping in the car to needing to know everything. Where are we going? What are we going to do? Everybody's favorite? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? This looks like the way to the doctor's office. We start needing to know everything. And it gets worse as we grow up. We think we know everything. So it makes no sense at all, does it? <clears throat> Some man-made principles work, but most don't. When we plan with our human minds and our desires, we run into problems. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Again in 1 Corinthians 3.18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. Paul is quoting Job 5.13 there, and we'll be talking about Job later. It says it in the Proverbs as well. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Again, in Proverbs 19.21, many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. God works in ways 
we don't understand. And one of those reasons is so that we can't boast. Again, in 1 Corinthians 1.26, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. All glory belongs to God, not man. I began to figure that out when I made the transition from the business world to the ministry world. Some of you know my story. You know that I come from the business world, the martial arts business in particular. And when I started uh, doing ministry full time, I began to realize that a lot of the principles that I lived my life by in business didn't reconcile well with biblical Christianity. I did, however, find that a lot of martial arts principles do, do, they actually do, not because of the fighting, the principles of them. You see, martial arts, when practiced properly, require, requires humility. Now, I say that very carefully because I didn't always practice with humility, right? But in principle, it does. I'll give you an idea. When you first walk into a martial arts school, you're new, right? And maybe you're a big guy. You go in there and a little skinny kid beats you up. You get humble quick. A girl taps you out. You get humble quick, right? And then if you're smart, you begin to think, who else knows this out there? So you get humble. Martial arts also requires a certain degree of faith. You see, in martial arts, you're on a need-to-know basis, right? You don't learn all the advanced techniques right away. You start at beginner, you go to intermediate, and you go to advanced. And if it's a good martial art, it takes a very, very long time. And the whole time, you're on a need-to-know. Does everyone remember the uh, 80s movie, The Karate Kid? One, two hands, The Karate Kid! Come on! <laughs> yeah, okay, right? It was a great movie. I don't like the remake, but the 80s movie. My wife Heather informed me on um, Thursday, actually, was the 33rd anniversary of that movie. Yeah, 33 years. <laughs> I know. I feel it. <laughs> yeah, 33 years. There's a lesson from that movie, though, I want to apply to this teaching, and I figure 33 years is a long time to forget. So I made a video for you all. Just to summarize, okay? So let's check it out. The Karate Kid is a movie about Daniel LaRusso, who's kind of a punk when you think about it. You see, at a Halloween dance, Daniel decides to pull a prank on Johnny of the Cobra Kai gang. Now, Johnny's no saint, but turn the other cheek, Daniel. Just saying. But Daniel doesn't listen to Jesus. Johnny gets mad, and the whole Cobra Kai gang chases him, and it causes a car accident. They chase him down, and he makes the mistake of trying to climb a fence, which only works when dogs are chasing you because dogs don't have hands. Now, Daniel, he's getting what's coming to him, but then in comes Mr. Miyagi a.k.a. Pat Morita, a.k.a. Arnold from Happy Days. It all came together right there. Miyagi does what Daniel can't, jumping fences, kicking, punching, winning fights, saving the day. He teaches Daniel karate in case he can't be there the next time Daniel pranks someone. Now, Daniel is Daniel's son, kind of like how Abram became Abraham, but not really. He's going to learn karate now, but first he has Daniel do some chores, and Daniel looks surprisingly happy about that. Miyagi's big on form, but he obviously doesn't spend enough time on it, clearly, because Daniel doesn't do it the right way. Miyagi comes in, he tries to correct it, but essentially is a waste of a day. So they try painting next. This time he spends more time with Daniel working on his form. Up, down, up, down, working on the form. But soon, Daniel's going to be done with all the chores. He's going to start complaining. So here he starts complaining at this point in the movie, Daniel says some bad words. Now Miyagi, he's had enough. So he says, come here. Daniel can't, his shoulder hurts. But Miyagi, he's going to fix it so he can reveal the plan. Show me wax on, wax off. Catch! 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 Show me pen to fence. Catch! Pace! Catch! Catch! Oi. Daniel's mind is blown and his faith in Miyagi is restored. He was on a need-to-know basis, right? He couldn't figure out why he was doing all that stuff. He just had to have faith, right? So it was a test as well. And that test built his faith. It says to a student, hey, 
You may not know why I'm doing these crazy things, but you just need to trust me that it's for your good. God does that in us as well. David invited God to test him. He says in Psalm 26.2, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and heart. Psalm 139.23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. How does God test us? Well, if we go back to Hebrews, that was all about faith, right? Hebrews 11:17. By faith, Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Now that is faith. Isaiah 48:10. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. It is through the test that we're refined. Here's how James says it. James 1, 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. These tests and trials, they help build our faith. And when we are in faith, we're, in a need, we're on a need-to-know basis. This is said of Job. Remember Job? All kinds of bad things happened to Job. In 30-something chapters, he and his friends are trying to figure out what, what happened, right? Finally, the 38th chapter, God shows up on the scene. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you'll instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? God, he didn't know Job an explanation, and he didn't give him one either. Look at Ecclesiastes 11.5. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how born, bones are form, formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. There's a way in which we do things and we don't always trust the Lord, right? Look what James says, James 4.13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. There's that boasting again. Notice there's a formula there. Look at James 4.15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. We will live and also do this or that. The Lord's will, his way. Then after that, it's what you do. He's the one in charge. The general gives the marching orders, not the other way around. The private, he just knows his little part in the overall plan. We need to have faith. We are on a need to know basis. And I understand it's difficult for us. Some of the Bible stories, they seem so far off. I struggle with it too. We say things like, oh, it's more complex now. The times are different somehow. The times might be different, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says that in Hebrews 2. So I wanted to give you an example of biblical faith lived out in more modern times. Some of you may have heard of George Mueller. Right? George Mueller was a Christian minister. He lived in the 1800s. Now, you might Im immediately say, whoa, 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 that's not modern times. Relatively speaking, compared to biblical times, it is. It's only about 150 or so years ago. Plus, if you are really struggling with your faith this morning, you have photographic evidence, right? <laughs> Should we need that? <clears throat> George Mueller, he had a business plan. It was a good one. It was a simple one. It can be summarized in one word, prayer. That was it. He was interviewed toward the end of his life. He said the following, during all these years, I have been enabled to trust in the living God alone. In answer to prayer, $7,500,000 have been sent to me. I just want to pause it there. It's about $220 million in today's money. We have needed as much as $200,000 in one year, and all has come when needed. No man can ever say I asked him for a penny. 
We have no committees, no collectors, no voting, and no endowment. All has come in answer to believing prayer. God has many ways of moving the hearts of men all over the world to help us. The interviewer asks, I suppose you have never contemplated a reserve fund. George answers, to do so would be an act of the greatest folly. How could I pray if I had reserves? God would say, bring out those reserves, George Mueller. Oh no, I never thought of such a thing. Our reserve fund is in heaven. The living God is our sufficiency. I love that line. The living God is our sufficiency. Amen, George. The interviewer asks, do you save for yourself? Save for myself, he answers. I dare not save. It would dishonor my loving, gracious, all-bountiful Father. Ouch. Hurts. At least me, anyway. And by faith, God provided him bountifully. There are a lot of people who would definitely not like to agree with George. Sometimes I don't either. And I'm not asking you to take my word for it. So I'm going to step aside for a moment and let Jesus do the teaching. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can see that formula again. Let's look at Luke 12:30. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Him. Seek Him, His will, His kingdom, then your needs. I'm excited about our Acts series coming up this fall. We're going to start it in October. There, we'll see how the church acted as a community of faith. They followed Jesus' instructions. 
They gave to charity, and so much was added to them. As Christians, disciples of Jesus, are we ready to take a supernatural approach to the way of doing things in our homes, in our lives, in our workplaces, here in our church? My prayer for us today is this. Heavenly Father, I ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Enable us to trust in you more completely. Take us to a deeper level of faith in our daily lives, in our thoughts, and in our hearts. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to check out this sermon from C3 Church in Naples, Florida. Our pastors are truly grateful that their teaching can be a part of your worshiping God this week. If you have any questions about the sermons, feel free to contact us via email or Facebook. If you'd like more information about our church, you can fill out the Connect form on our website, www.c3naples.org. Finally, if you feel led to give a donation toward the furthering of God's kingdom and the preaching of the gospel at C3 Church, you can click Give on our website, which will allow you to give a one-time or reoccurring gift. Once again, thanks for watching our latest sermon video, and please consider joining us at one of our worship services on a Sunday, our blended service at 9.30 a.m., and our modern service at 11 a.m. We meet at 15300 Tamiami Trail North in Naples. Have a blessed day.